Hey everyone, I'm Corey, and welcome to my writing channel, where I get into all the technical aspects of writing narrative prose in the hopes I might ease the learning curve for all you aspiring writers out there. In this video, I'll be taking you through the most valuable lessons I learned while studying the dialogue of the renowned American war novelist Herman Wouk, all excerpts taken from his novel The Winds of War, written in 1971. Let's get into it. Now, what makes good dialogue is a complicated question. It can be nuanced and subtle, not to mention relative and contextual. And in my experience, it takes seeing a technique multiple times before you're confident enough to include it in your own writing. So in order to look at Wook's dialogue in a holistic way, I've decided to format this video by taking you through a series of 18 examples, some lengthy, others short, and highlighting the methods and techniques Wook implements as they become relevant. So just sit back, digest what you can, and with a little repetition, it'll start to click. There are six major components of dialogue that Wook seems to focus on, and while some are highlighted by specific examples, others you'll find are present in just about all of them. The first example, I've split into halves. It's so peaceful, isn't it? So goddamn peaceful. Dad, what's happening in the war? Has Warsaw surrendered? Have the Allies gotten off their tails yet? The Germans are such liars, you never know. Warsaw's still holding out, but the war there is really over. There's a lot of talk about peace in the West, too. Honestly? Already? God, will you look at that cafe? 500 Berliners, if there's one. Eating pastry and drinking coffee, laughing, talking. Ah, to be a Berliner. Where was I? Oh yes. Well, anyway, at this point, see, the water pump gave out and the fan belt broke. The German planes never stopped going by overhead. The bride was having hysterics. We were 20 miles from the nearest town. There was a cluster of farmhouses about a mile down the road. They'd been bombed to pieces, so... Farmhouses? Pug broke in alertly. Even out of context, it quickly becomes apparent that the son in this scene is full of nervous energy and acting a bit erratic, which fits with the context as he's just returned from a traumatic event. This is an instance of showing a character's mental or emotional state through dialogue, which is something Wook does often, as it's a great way to flesh out characters and make them come alive on the page. Wook also uses a fair number of question marks and exclamation points when writing the son's dialogue, as well as using many short, blunt sentence structures, all of which work together to enrich the neurotic tone. In addition, he writes a tangent into the dialogue, where the son gets distracted by how nice everything is in Berlin, which not only enhances his scatterbrain tone, but adds a description of the setting. It is also possible, as we'll see in later examples, to describe actions or even give exposition through dialogue. In addition, we'll be taking a look at several techniques that will make your dialogue sound more natural. Let's skip eight pages further, where, within the same context and with the same characters, we get this chunk of dialogue. God, this is the life, Byron said, as they gave orders to a bowing, smiling waiter. Look at all these nice, polite, cordial, joking, happy Berliners, will you? Did you ever see a nicer city? So clean, all those fine statues and baroque buildings, like that marvelous opera, and all the spanking new modern ones, and all the gardens and trees. Why, I've never seen such a green, clean city. Berlin's almost like a city built in a forest. And all the canals and the quaint little boats. Did you see that tug that sort of tips its smokestack to get under the bridges? Completely charming. The only thing is, these pleasant folks have just been blowing the hell out of Poland, machine gunning people from the sky, I've got the scar to prove it, pounding a city just as nice as Berlin to a horrible pulp. It's a puzzle, you might say. As you can see, this dialogue continues to show the erratic, exclaimed, high-energy state of the sun, Byron, as well as describe more of the setting. It also flows nicely, the way he transitions from the people, to the city, to the buildings, to the nature, to their ingenuity, and then takes a sharp turn with the transition, the only thing is, toward the horrors of war. This is the style of dialogue which makes a bunch of observations and then comments on or contrasts something against those observations. And this dialogue has yet another layer, something Herman Wouk does masterfully throughout the winds of war, and that is providing thought-provoking insights into complex themes and or questions. Here, through a character's dialogue, he's describing for the reader a common trend of war, namely how governments can commit brutal atrocities in foreign countries while at home their citizens are just going about their lives, fed their propaganda and growing fat on the spoils of victory. And he sums this up using words words which suit the character speaking with, it's a puzzle, you might say. If your aim is to achieve elegance, nuance, or subtlety in your writing, you have to adopt the mindset of planting questions in your reader's brain so that they arrive at the questions on their own. It can be awkward, jarring, and even leave a bad taste in the reader's mouth if you, the writer, are too heavy-handed with your themes and symbolism, like you're tugging the reader by a leash instead of guiding an experience that is uniquely their own. You also want to be careful and patient when tackling complex topics, and make sure you don't get too out of your depth. But at the same time, art is about stretching the limits of your own understanding, so I say aim for the stars, because at the very least, you'll touch the clouds. Let's take a look at our next example. I promise they will get smaller and quicker. Watch what you're doing, please, Colonel Forrest said. The waiter went on with his brusque, sloppy clearing. Sally Forrest gave a little yelp as he struck her head with a plate. Pug said to him, look, call your head waiter, please. Head waiter, I am the head waiter. I am your head. The man laughed and walked off. Dirty dishes remained scattered on the table. Wet purple and brown messes stained the cloth. Forrest said to Henry, it might be smart to leave. Oh, by all means, Sally Forrest said. Just pay, Bill, and we'll go. 
She picked up her purse. We haven't had our dessert, Puck Henry said. It might be an idea to knock that waiter on his behind, Dr. Kirby said, his face disagreeably contorted. I volunteer, said Byron, and he started to get up. For God's sake, boy, Colonel Forrest pulled him back. An incident is just what he wants, and what we can't have. The waiter was striding past them to another table. Henry called, I asked you to bring your head waiter. You're in a hurry, honorable sir? The waiter jeered. Then you'd better leave. We're very busy in this restaurant. He turned a stout back on Henry and walked away. Stop. Turn around. Pug did not shout or bark. He used a dry, sharp tone of command that cut through the restaurant gavel. The waiter stopped and turned. Go call your head waiter. Do it immediately. He looked straight into the waiter's eyes, his face serious and hard. The waiter's glance shifted, and he walked off in another direction. The nearby diners were staring and muttering. I think we should go, Sally Forrest said. This isn't worth the trouble. The waiter soon approached, followed by a tall, bald, long-faced man in a frock coat, who said with a busy, unfriendly air, Yes, you have a complaint? We're a party of Americans, military attachés, Pug said. We didn't rise for your anthem. We're neutrals. This waiter chose to take offense. He gestured at the table. He's been deliberately clumsy and dirty. He's talked rudely. He's jostled the ladies. His conduct has been swinish. Tell him to behave himself, and be good enough to let us have a clean cloth for our dessert. I had to subject you to at least one long example like this, so we could take a look at some of the technical tools Whoop uses to write dialogue for a group, and how the dialogue, along with all the little descriptions and actions in between, change as the tone of the scene shifts. Let's start by looking at what are called dialogue tags. That is, the few words that often precede or follow a line of dialogue to let the reader know who is speaking, and perhaps even how they are speaking. Notice how Wook is always alternating the placement of his dialogue tags. First, it comes after the dialogue, then before, then there is no tag, as the reader can infer who is speaking. Then it comes before, after, 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 after. Then the dialogue tag is replaced with an action beat. I'll explain those shortly. Then it's put before, after, using the tag jeered instead of said. No tag again. Then after, before, and after. Variety isn't absolutely necessary. My default is to place the tag after the dialogue, but it often works very well for group scenes. And always remember, you don't need to use a dialogue tag if it's already clear who's speaking. I should also note that Wook prefers to put his saids after the name of the person speaking, but you can also put them before, as is my preference. And try not to use expressive dialogue tags like jeered, exclaimed, or sneered too frequently. Some say never at all, but I find they have their time and place. Still, I'd guess about 95% of my tags are either said or asked. Next, let's look at action beats. These are all the brief actions, and I'll even include descriptions here, that are written between the lines of dialogue to break them up and provide context so it doesn't read like a bunch of people talking in a white room, known as white room syndrome. We see the first action beat here, which describes how the waiter is being sloppy, then how he knocks a woman's head with one of the plates, followed by this one, describing the waiter's reaction and the poor state of the table. Another quick one here, and then we have an action beat tied on via comma to this dialogue tag. Another one tied onto this tag, this action beat, as previously mentioned, actually replaces a dialogue tag entirely, which is a concise method for letting the reader know who said the line. This passive statement just adds a bit of motion and context. Same with this next active statement. And here we have the real interesting beats. That is, all these concise, blunt descriptions befitting the character Pug. I won't bother with the rest of the action beats, I think you get the gist. Sort of endless possibilities, really. Just make sure your beats are concise, inconspicuous, and kept in the background so the reader's focus is on the dialogue. They're just little reminders of what's going on outside of talking. Now, let's look at the dialogue itself, the primary purpose of which is to highlight the personality of the character Pug. While everyone is saying they should all just leave and not bother with the inconvenient confrontation, Pug is calm and silent and gives the waiter a reminder. The waiter brushes him off for a second time, but Pug does not back down. He gives the waiter a command, which Wook italicizes. Instead of a dialogue tag, he combines it with an action beat, which is a nifty technique. Pug speaks in stern, concise commands, then gives a stern, concise description of events. He is a strong-willed man and has an air of authority, shown in how he speaks up when most others would rather avoid confrontation. Now, before we fly through a number of quick examples, let's take a look at one more long one so I can cap off this list of lessons which pop up all over. So, you're prepared to get the United States of America into this war all by yourself, are you, Captain? said Ernest King at last with frigid sarcasm. Well, that's one way for an obscure person to go down in history. Admiral, it's the President's judgment that this exercise will go off without incident. So you said. Well, suppose his judgment's wrong. Suppose a U-boat fires a fish at you. What then? If we're fired on, sir, why? I propose to fire back. That won't start a war unless Hitler wants war. Ernest King nodded peevishly. Hell, we're in this war anyway. It doesn't matter too much when or how the whistle blows. The Japanese are going to kick it off against us when it suits them and the Germans. Probably when it least suits us. I agree with Mr. Roosevelt that it very likely won't happen now. But how about the battle cruisers? Hey, thought about them? The Scharnhorst? The Nishnau? They've picked off more than 100,000 tons in the past month. 
Yes, sir. I hope the Catalinas will warn us if they're around so we can evade. Admiral King said, that's a big ocean out there. The air patrol can easily miss them. Well, then the cruisers can miss us too, Admiral. After another pause, looking Victor Henry over like a dog he was considering buying, King picked up the telephone. Get me Admiral Bristol. Henry, you have nothing in writing? No, sir. What I want to start off with here is how Wook shows character dynamics through his dialogue. That is, how one character's presence affects the way another behaves, and vice versa. In this example, Victor Henry, who is actually the strong, assertive character nicknamed Pug from the previous example, is speaking with an admiral, Ernest King, not a waiter who had wronged him, and so is speaking in a more cordial, professional way while the admiral speaks freely. Notice the demanding and questioning tone of the admiral, and how he speaks about Victor Henry without caring whether he gives any offense, saying things like, well, that's one way for an obscure person to go down in history, and questioning Henry's every word, not to mention the wonderfully descriptive action beat. After another long pause, looking Victor Henry over like a dog he was considering buying, King picked up the telephone. I don't know about you, but for me, that line really made the power dynamic between Victor Henry and the Admiral come alive, at least as it's perceived by the Admiral. Adding to the Admiral's personality, Wook animates his speech with a questioning tone, and by using exclamations to show him as a boiling kettle sort. Two other subtleties in the dialogue that stick out to me are as follows. Here, when the Admiral blatantly questions the President's judgment, later to agree with it, as if being disagreeable is just in his nature, no matter with whom. And here, with the brief, hey, thought about them, emphasizing how pushy and in-your-face he is. The dialogue also flows very naturally, in that question-and-answer kind of way, and gets across some exposition as well, providing the reader with information about the conflict that is being discussed while it's being discussed, without either of the two characters saying anything awkward that sounds like it's just being said for the reader's sake. Take a minute to look through the dialogue tags and action beats if you want, but in the interest of time, I won't go through them now. How about we fly through some short examples? With these, I'm just going to focus on the primary technique or method on display, and not delve too much into the nitty gritty like I did in the previous examples, but I will highlight which of the six aspects are on display, so you can see how often Wook is conveying many things at the same time. Briny, what about that report? How's it coming? The report? Oh yes, the report. Byron leaned forward in his chair, legs apart, elbows on knees, hands clasped. Dad, I'd like to ask you something. What would you think of my joining the British Navy, or the RAF? This is great, especially if you had more context, because it shows Byron's personality so well and how he acknowledges the question but doesn't really pay it much mind, and then proceeds to start down an entirely new topic of conversation. It's also an example of how you can use an action beat to slow down the pace and convey a sort of pause between the lines of dialogue. Come along. Oh, Palmer, don't tease me. Dear me, I was supposed to call you Fred, wasn't I? And now I find I've been thinking of you all along as Palmer. Fred. Well, there are so many Freds. You don't strike me as a Fred. This little bit of dialogue does a great job of imparting to the reader that this character is fairly neurotic, and perhaps a bit nervous or giddy. It's very stream of consciousness, which gives it that talking on a tangent feeling that can be used at times to make your dialogue sound more natural. He also repeats the name Fred multiple times to emphasize this. Here's another example where you can see Whoop capturing the same personality. Aren't you clever to wear that suit? I dress for spring and it's positively arctic here, Rhoda said. Where's Madeline? Is she alright? Quickly, Janice explained why the daughter hadn't come. Well, hasn't Mad turned into the little career girl? My dear, I want to kiss you, but I daren't. Don't come near me. I'm virulent. I'll infect the nation. Well, how beautiful you are. You're ravishing. Lucky Warren. How is he, anyway? Notice how in order to give it that stream of consciousness feel, you basically just need to narrate your character's thoughts as you imagine they might arise. What you're saying is the straight communist line, you know, Janice said. Oh, Bosie's a communist, Madeline said, emerging from behind the screen with a wooden bowl of salad. Dinner's ready. Will you dress the salad, Bosie? Sure thing. Bosie took the bowl to a rickety little side table and made expert motions with oil, vinegar, and condiments. I'm not sure I've ever met a communist before, Warren said, peering at the long brown man. My gosh, you haven't, said Madeline. Why, the radio business swarms with them. This example may seem fairly bland or ordinary, and it sort of is, but it highlights something Wook does very well and often, and that is writing his dialogue in a flow that's not entirely linear, giving it a natural, realistic feel. Here, the conversation briefly veers off from communism to salad dressing, then casually back to communism. It's a small touch, but in my opinion, these subtleties are what really makes an author's writing come alive. What's happening? Victor Henry asked. Oh, it's the war, naturally. Just more of the same. The Germans have overrun some new town, and the French are collapsing, and so on. Nothing very unexpected. He will have a fit when he hears they cut the butcher with the zither. This chunk of dialogue struck me as quite elegant when I read it, as it's not just providing the reader with exposition about what's happening in the war, but it's showing us a major theme in The Winds of War, namely how people are quite detached from conflicts outside of their own, by showing us this character ever so casually mentioning the death of thousands and the falling of a nation, before expressing how she is more concerned about how they cut the butcher with the zither. Now, I have no idea what this actually means, and apparently neither does Google, but it's clear from the context that it is some trivial inconvenience. Let me know in the comments if you can make heads or tails of it. 
Her face turned anxious. She took his hand. Angel, there's some Jewish law about not getting married too soon after a parent dies. Possibly for as long as a year, and good heavens, don't make such a face. I'm not going to observe that. Yes, no doubt. I certainly don't look forward to writing to Leslie. Jehoshaphat, that scowl again. You put it on and off like a Halloween mask. It's unnerving. Bryony, he came down to see me right after Papa died. What I wanted to show you here are the interruptions Wook uses for sharp transitions in his dialogue, which also serve to describe the reaction of another character without leaving the quotations. Here, this character is reacting with dialogue in real time to the expression on the face of the character she's speaking to, and this helps paint a picture in the reader's mind. It's also another example of how non-linear dialogue can come across as very natural. One thing you'll pick up on reading Wook's writing, or The Winds of War, at least, is how much all of his characters feel like real people, and it's not really one technique so much as it is all these techniques layered in when appropriate. Here's another example of some great non-linear, broken-up, natural-sounding dialogue which uses a similar technique. Warren, I hope you believe me. Thanks. Thanks, boy. Just a little more. This is a damn good brandy. Nearly everything I've been doing in the past two years has given me a swift pain in the ass. How did it ever start, Dad? Here, have some more. No, no, Warren. I'm feeling no pain at all as it is. Well, okay. Just wet the bottom of the glass. Thanks, boy. How did it start? Well, Pug recounted his prediction of the Nazi-Soviet pact, his visits with the president, his assembling of the planes for England, and his reports from Berlin. Take a look at how Wook is using his M dashes. Here, he sandwiches one bit of dialogue to make it an aside. Here, he uses one to convey the passage of time, implying that between this line and him saying thanks, more wine was poured into his glass. And here, he uses one to cut off the actual dialogue, and summarizes something that the reader already knows, but that the character he's speaking to does not. As you can see, there are a lot of options for structuring your dialogue with punctuation, so don't be afraid to get creative and risk making mistakes. Just try and hear the sound of the dialogue in your head, then try and figure out what punctuation best fits. Sipping his martini, his pose in the wheelchair as relaxed as before, but the patrician tone subtly hardening for business, Roosevelt said, Do you think the British will hold out, Pug, if the French collapse? I threw this one in here to give you an example of a long dialogue tag which precedes the dialogue itself, as sort of a setup. Just one more tool to add to your belt. You can also put a long dialogue tag after the dialogue, as is probably more common, such as... Oh, mother, said Janice, as the white-coated old Filipino, a retired navy steward hired by Rhoda for the evening, shakily filled the glass in her outstretched hand. General Tillett said, I take it you think rather well of our cavity magnetron. It's a major breakthrough, General. Hmm, yes. Strange, isn't it, that warfare has come down to fencing with complicated toys that only a few seedy scholars can make or understand. This line is great, and often quoted, as it essentially poses a complex question to the reader and leads them to ponder. It's also a great opportunity to show a particular character as being insightful. Here's another example of posing a complex question. I don't know, Pug remarked to Burn Wilk. Maybe the only thing you can say for democracy is that all other forms of government are even worse. Worse for what? was the Air Commodore's acid reply. If other forms are better for winning wars, no other virtue counts. Wook also uses dialogue to ask complex questions of a different nature, like when he uses it to describe deja vu. Pam, I've never visited Tolstoy's grave before, certainly not with you, but I swear I remember all this, and most of all the nice way you've got that hat tilted. As her hand went up to her hat, he added, and I could have told you you'd lift that hand, and the sun would make your ring sparkle. Notice how he doesn't once use the word deja vu. He just describes it, giving the reader the joy of arriving at their own understanding, and perhaps even that of reminiscing over a time they themselves had deja vu. To the best of your ability, you always want to be sparking things like intrigue and personal experience in your reader's mind. You're not bulging, said Victor Henry, trying to fix the snaps despite the poor light on her back. You look very pretty. Oh, Pug, for God's sake, I'm bulging afoot. I look six months pregnant. I'm horrible, and I'm wearing my tightest girdle. Oh, what'll I do? Her husband finished closing the snaps and left her. Rhoda looked much the same as always, and was making much the usual evening dress noises. Her laments and queries were rhetorical, and best ignored. What I love here is not only the dialogue itself, showing the husband's personality as being particularly husbandy, with his brief, simple comments, and the wife's personality as, well, she's that same neurotic, nervous energy character from before, but I also love how Wook follows up the dialogue with more insights written in prose and from the husband's perspective, saying, her laments and queries were rhetorical and best ignored. I think this line captures this side of the relationship very elegantly. Byron said, Thanks. Pretty grim issue of time. Hell, Briny, you knew the Germans would take the Ruskies, didn't you? The Russian's a hardy soldier, but that Bolshevik government's just a mess of crackpot politicians. Stalin shot half his officers in 38, including all the professionals left from the Tsarist days. You can't fight a war without career officers. That's where the Germans have us all licked. That general staff of theirs has been going on for a hundred years. The day they lost the last war, why, they just started collecting maps and dope for fighting this one. That's a savvy outfit. How about some wine? California Burgundy gets here in pretty fair shape. Sure. Returning with a big purple bottle, Warren said, Well, there's one good thing. If Hitler does take Moscow, the Japs will jump north to grab their end of Siberia. 
ending off with a couple longer excerpts. Here we have a chunk of dialogue that is accomplishing quite a bit, narratively speaking, by smoothly giving the reader some exposition about the current state of the war, providing insight into why some militaries collapse while others grow stronger, and conveying to the reader this character's personality, someone who is educated, opinionated, and also speaks about war like a tactician, and not someone suffering from it, using phrases like, that's where the Germans have us all licked, and the Japs will jump north, which have slightly light-hearted connotations. In addition, we see again here a non-linear tangent in the dialogue, adding a natural feel to it. He said in a quavering voice, clearing it of hoarseness as he talked, well, the eminent author's niece, eh? What a pleasure. I'm sorry I couldn't see you this morning, but I was just up to my ears. It's perfectly all right, Natalie said. He waved his little hand loosely. People have been scurrying home in droves, you see, and just dumping everything on the consulate. There's an awful lot of commerce still going on, and I'm stuck with the paperwork. I'm becoming a sort of broker and business agent for any number of American companies. Unpaid, of course. I was in the most unbelievable snarl this morning over, of all things, a truckload of insecticide. Can you bear it? And, of course, there still are Americans in Florence. The screwier they are, the longer they stay. He giggled and rubbed his back hair. The trouble I've been having with these two girls, roommates from California. I can't mention names, but one of them is from a rich Pasadena oil family. Well, she's gotten herself engaged to this slick little Florentine chic who calls himself an actor but is actually nothing but an overgrown grocery boy. Well, this oily charmer has gone and gotten her roommate pregnant, my dear. The three of them have been having all night brawls the police have been in and, oh well, you don't get rich in this work, but there's never a dull moment. He poured water from a tall bottle into a heavy cut glass goblet and drank. Excuse me, would you like some Evian water? No, thank you. I have to drink an awful lot of it. Some stupid kidney thing. Somehow it gets worse in the spring. I actually think Italian weather leaves a lot to be desired, don't you? Well, his inquiring bland look seemed to add, what can I do for you? Just listen to the personality in this. Need I say any more? I could spend an hour unpacking everything, especially if I include more context, but what I want to do here is break dialogue up into two components. First, there is what a character says, and then there is how they say it. This character says literally everything on his mind to someone he just met, and is constantly elaborating on everything he does say, going off on tangents and often getting too personal. He doesn't just ask her if she wants some Evian water, he explains how he has to drink a lot of it for his kidneys, and how it gets worse in the spring, and how the Italian weather leaves a lot to be desired. You see what I mean? Wook also uses a nice technique here, applying dialogue to an expression in order to describe the expression, because sometimes a look says it all. He breaks it from the prose with an M dash to give it a little more distance, slowing down the pace to emphasize a pause in the landslide of speech, and puts the pseudo dialogue in italics to show that no one actually spoke these words aloud. Anyway, I hope you found these techniques useful. Give them a try next time you sit down to write, and be sure to like and subscribe for more technical writing videos.